Today our Gospel reading comes to us from John's Gospel, in the 11th chapter, verses 32 through 37. And in chapter 11, a little context, uh, we hear the story of a family, a family that loved one another, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And while Jesus has been away from dear friends that he loved abundantly, Lazarus has died. Listen to these words from Holy Scripture. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, I, I think I had two more verses, right? There was a great dramatic ending there, too. Let's keep on going, because reading the Bible is good. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Now this is the word of the Lord too. Thanks be to God. We're going to blame that on rookie mistakes. I want to tell you the story about a, a wonderful man that I have encountered in my life. His name uh, was Don. Don was 83 years old when I first encountered him. My grandfather said, find folks who are older than you who have lived lives of integrity and honor and drink from their well. And I had found that in the person of Don. Don was a retired firefighter in the city of Elkins, and he would be at church Every Sunday morning, church would begin at 9 o'clock. Don would be there at 8.45, greeting people with his friendly and loving demeanor. The years had colored his hair white, but he would always be clean-shaven, dressed appropriately for the occasion. Whether it was 85 degrees on a sunny day or negative 2 with 3 inches of snow on the ground, Don would be at church. I came to love and appreciate Don. And being a firefighter in the city of Elkins, we would sit down at the kitchen table at the firehouse, drink our coffee, and occasionally Don would walk in, dressed appropriately for the occasion, be very nice, quiet. And you would never hear Don say a harsh word about anybody. Now, sometimes there are people in life that rub us the wrong way, and we're really tempted to say something non-becoming of Christians, and Don would never say anything terrible. He would just say, oh, so-and-so, they're just a little different. <laughs> so when his daughter called me, uh, it was about a year ago, uh, she said, Dad has fallen, and he's laid there all night, and waited until 8 o'clock in the morning to call me because he didn't wake me up, want to wake me up from my sleep. We've taken him to the hospital. Could you come and visit him? So I see Ruth, his daughter, in the lobby, and she says, Dad is dehydrated, but he hasn't broken anything. And the doctors believe that he's going to be able to go home later this week. This is good news. So I walk into this hospital room, and Don is lying there connected to uh, the IV drip, rehydrating and bringing nutrients to his body. We have a nice conversation with his daughter, Ruth, and her husband, Rex, and they leave, and I get to that very nice pastoral moment that I treasure in my life. And I looked at Don, and I said, Don, how can I be praying for you? He looked me in the eyes, and he said, Pastor, pray that the Lord would take me home today. 
Now, I don't normally pray for people to be taken home to the Lord. So what was I going to do? Um, I said, Don, I don't know that your work here is done. The doctors are very hopeful that you're going to be home later this week. And he said, I'm really tired. And I miss my wife, Jimmy, who had gone to be with the Lord. So we prayed, and I did not pray that the Lord would take him home, maybe Don did, but I prayed that the Lord's will would be done, that his body would be strengthened, that he would know peace and know strength and know hope, and if the Lord had more work for him to do, that he would leave the hospital and go on to do that. Well, Don did not get his prayer answered that day. His body went to be filled in the ground a week later. Don died on Thursday. Selfishly, I did not get my prayer answered either. Because here was this man that I looked up to. That the doctor said, this illness will not lead to his death. He's going to go home. And as a pastor, I should know better, right? But I, I said to myself, on the day that he died on Thursday, I said, Lord, where are you in the midst of this? Lord, where are you in the midst of this? Earlier this week, I was chatting with my friend Shanna, our children and family ministry coordinator, talking about our mox uh, population. We have a wonderful Mothers of Preschooler ministry that happens here. And do you know what? A lot of those young women who love their children and their family are not necessarily involved in a family of faith. They come here to find uh, relationships and support and love. And Shannon and I were talking. Shannon said, a lot of these young ladies wonder what these words from Scripture that seemingly were written so long ago, what do they have to do with our lives today? And I think that that's an incredibly valid question, not just for people who are not involved in the life of the church, but for us sitting in these chairs today, what do these words have to do with our lives and our situation as we find ourselves living here today. The best sermon that I have ever heard preached didn't even come from a Christian. I was at this peacemaking conference and there was this Muslim imam who was from Saudi Arabia and he was chatting about his experience in the United States. He said, when I moved here, I expected that this would be much more of a Christian nation than I find it to be. Now, we can debate the merits of whether we are a Christian nation or not, but that was his perspective. And someone sitting in the audience said, well, what would it look like for us to embody those values of Christianity in our culture? Best sermon. The imam replied and said, if you want to be a Christian nation, you should read your Bibles. For folks who haven't read scripture, or for even those who do occasionally, some more often than not, read scripture. I believe that we find in these sacred words the stories of our faith ancestors, the story of our lives. For when we come to John chapter 11 that we read, earlier today, we find ourselves. We find a family unit, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We find Martha who worked too much. We find Mary who was criticized for not working enough, but rather adoring Jesus too much. All those wonderful ladies that we find in our churches today. We find Lazarus. We don't know much about his story, kind of like the men in our congregations today, except that he was dead. <laughs> We find in this story from John chapter 11 that Jesus loved this family so much. He had heard that Lazarus was sick and he had work to do in Bethany. So he stayed there two days longer. And then he was going to go back to visit Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And in this story in John chapter 11, we encounter that human condition where we find grief and sadness because, Je because Jesus wasn't there in time to see Lazarus before he had died. 
Lazarus was dead. In fact, scripture tells us that his body was already beginning to decay and it smelled. Jesus loved them so much. And we hear the grief coming from both Mary and Martha, who both said, Lord, if you had been here, Lazarus, my brother, would not be dead. And tell me if any of you are brave enough to admit that you haven't said something similar in your own life. Lord, if you had been here, this situation would have turned out much better. Lord, if you would have been in that hospital room, my friend Don would not have died. Your power is greater than his. And not even moments when we face the great mystery of death do we wonder, oh Lord, where are you in our relationships that we have in our family and our homes when we encounter love or the broken love between two people, husband and a wife or a parent or child or friend. Lord, if you had been here, this terrible thing would not have happened. Earlier in John chapter 11, in the midst of this story, when Jesus was first told about Lazarus, he said this to his disciples, this sickness will not lead to death. So is Jesus wrong? Lazarus died. Now we encounter at the end of chapter 11 this fabulous story of Resurrection. Jesus wasn't the only person who was resurrected from the dead. We have this guy named Lazarus, whose body had been decaying. We experience a family grieving. And Jesus said, for this, my glory will be revealed. And he called into the tomb and says, Lazarus, come out. And we encounter this wonderful miracle. So even though Lazarus has died, he now lives again. In the story of the scripture, this is not the sickness that will lead to death. Jesus was right. But has anyone seen Lazarus walking around today? This 2,000 year old man. Again, Lazarus eventually died. This is not the illness that will lead to death. So what was Jesus talking about? Some of you may have heard this uh, 19th century theologian philosopher named Soren Kierkegaard. Soren Kierkegaard takes this scripture, this will not lead, this sickness will not lead to death, and he asks the question, if it wasn't this illness that brought about Lazarus' death, what would it be? He says, as Christians, we who believe in the resurrection know that even our physical death, when Lazarus died again, did not lead to his death. It led to life eternal. So as Christians, we who believe know that none of our illnesses, none of our pains, sicknesses, sufferings, broken relationship will lead to our physical death. We know that. So what was Jesus talking about? What are those things that lead us to death? Kierkegaard wrote a book called The Sickness Unto Death. And he says that this sickness that we know is not death because we have victory in the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sickness is this psychological, I would dare say spiritual perspective of despair. We've all encountered despair in our lives. Kierkegaard says there are three categories that he is able to spell out to define despair. The first and the lowest level is how we are spiritual beings. We have mortal, finite, physical bodies, yet we've been endowed as the crown jewel of all creation with this infinite spiritual soul within us. We are this the synthesis of being. How do we understand ourselves? The first level of despair is this, that we don't even recognize that we're spiritual people. And he says that many people, many of us, run around in our lives and we feign and even pretend
pretend and believe that we're living the good life, all the while we, while we are ignoring this incredible, wonderful, spiritual aspect of our lives. The next level of the hierarchy of despair is that we recognize that we're spiritual beings. Yet we either, A, feel so guilty about all the sins that we commit that we don't engage in the spiritual life, or B, that we know about the spiritual life yet fail to live into it. And the third level is this, the highest form, he says it's the most dangerous form of despair, is that we recognize that we are these spiritual beings. Yet we intentionally neglect the spiritual side of ourselves, committing sin against God and failing to realize the fullness of our potential. Kierkegaard is an existentialist philosopher. You may know those existentialists, uh, John Paul Sartre or Albert Camus. I love Kierkegaard because he was a Christian. Kierkegaard says that this despair that we know in our lives, neglecting this beautiful spiritual synthesis, that is the sickness that leads to our spiritual death. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look around this wonderful world that we have to see the spiritual death occurring all around. As a culture, we tell people to be all that you can be, and we fail to tell them that that involves taking care of the spiritual aspect of you, which is vital, that is what makes you, you. And when we are able to recognize our spiritual selves and live our lives in appropriate relation to our Creator, that's when we are able to exit the despair, to exit the sickness that does lead to our spiritual. In the midst of John's gospel, Jesus says these words that I say at every funeral. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And those who live and believe in me will never die. And then he looks at Martha right in the eye and says, do you believe this? And friends, I believe that God, the creator of the universe, looks us into the eye and says, do you believe this? So many Christians today, I think intellectually we get it. Oh yeah, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, but we neglect soul tending ourselves. And despair enters into our life. And we have this sickness that leads to our spiritual death. But if we are able to live appropriately, individually, in community, with all of our being, seek that relationship with the creator of your fantastic synthesis, the finite and infinite, all wrapped up in the beauty of you, if we are able to rest in the arms of our Creator, growing ever so deeply every day. We can intellectually know that death has no claim upon us, but we can live existentially without that despair and in the goodness and hope and abundance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's go back to that hospital room in Elkins with Don. Don died. His body went to the ground. Yet even in the midst of his death, Don lived. Don lived without fear, knowing the goodness of his Lord that was calling him home, the love that he had for his wife. How are you able to live? Now, none of us are sitting in a hospital room right now. But I wonder how many of us are sitting in the hospital room for the spiritual health of our souls. 
I'm the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Do you believe this? Friends, my prayer is that we may believe and know the goodness and abundance and eternity of the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We come to the time of our offering.